So first off, I wish we were doing all the things that you're saying. We're doing some of them, and I'll try to uh, exemplify them. The other thing I would say is, um, before being a geneticist, actually, I studied six years of agronomy. So I'm a Virginian agronomist. I did zoology and soils and everything. Uh, and the six years is not because I was a bad student, but it takes six years to get an agronomy degree in Chile. So, uh, so after that, I went on to California, studied genetics, and uh, my passion has always been about wheat. So I'll tell you a little bit about what we're trying to do and how we are trying to marry genetics and wheat. And, and, and I always put this slide because for me, it's always about growing the plants in the field. So when I give this talk, or I talk to scientists, I'm usually kind of like the far, far extreme of the science because I actually grow plants in the field. And um, over here, I'm the far, far extreme because I'm a scientist, but I think there, it's not such extremes. I think there's a lot of space in the middle, and that's what we're trying to, to do in my, in my group. So we've been talking about uh, the, the food price index going up, and, and just to clearly show this, these big two spikes that we've had, coincide with social unrest. We have the economists talking about the end of cheap food, uh, hopefully that will trickle down to actually to the farms, to the payments. But I think that it's, it's, it's quite exciting now that suddenly uh, food is again on the front cover, and, and in a good way. So I think that now we're finally talking about how to feed the world, and we're asking the questions that actually are bringing out young scientists excited about working in plants, instead of trying to just cure cancer. So saying curing cancer is one way, but actually, if I can feed the people, that's another way of helping. So through the universities, through our system, we're seeing more and more young people very interested in working in crops. Which is, a, which is an encouraging sign. Uh, I imagine you know what that picture is, right? That's, uh, XP, that's PBI in Cambridge. And, and I put this picture with a lot of respect, just saying that you know, this is what happened in the UK and it happened all over the world. Our cultural research just went down. And basically, they tore down buildings just like this. And we've been trying in the last few years trying to reestablish that. But of course, under the current conditions where there's not that much money, we're trying to find innovative ways. I'll tell you, basically, and a lot of the research that, you know, basically what happened at PBI is still in your field. So a lot of the process that happened, a lot of those experimental processes are using not just the lead by elite process to make a new variety, which is what you see today, uh, the recommended list, but actually taking material that's a little bit different. Taking, for example, ice pot resistance from a wild species, or taking rust resistance also from wild species, that basically disappeared. But you still have it in your field, so all the varieties there, just to name a few, all have material that was actually coming from these wild species that normally just look like a weed, but have a lot of variation that we can use. So the, the question we've been asking ourselves is, basically breeders have tapped into that for the last 20, 30 years. Where is that new variation gonna come from? So one of the ways that we're trying to close that connect that uh, Tony talked about is through a program that looks to go back into the roots of wheat. So in this case, I'm just showing you where wheat is originally from. It's this two diploid genomes, so the A and the B genome, these two wheats that grow in the Fertile Crescent, and they give rise to emmer wheat. So emmer wheat is fantastic because actually you can cross that into bread wheat without any problem, so you don't need to do transgenics. And bread wheat got together, or sorry, emmer wheat got together about 10,000 years ago and made this thing called bread wheat. So bread wheat basically evolved just in the last 10,000 years. So whenever we cross bread wheat with bread wheat, we only have 10,000 years of evolution to play with. Whenever we cross wild emmer with bread wheat, we actually have 400,000 years, an adaptation to a lot of the climatic challenges that we face today. And wild emmer also gave rise to pasta wheat. So that's basically the history of wheat in one slide. And the way that we're trying to address this is trying to look at it in basically different levels. So we basically are looking at this wheat strategic program that BBSRC has funded. So BBSRC is kind of the, who funds the basic research, but they realize that they need to fund this to really push, uh, push the germplasm across. So we can take some of these alien species, although we're not supposed to call them alien, but basically take these wild species and through transgenic and non-transgenic means get some variation into bread wheat. At NIA, we're focusing actually on doing wild wheats in a, in a non-transgenic manner, moving some of that wild emmer and tausha back into bread wheat. And then we have land races, which is being focused at JIC, which is using land races and non-transgenic means. So basically, Nottingham, NIA, John Innes, Rothenstein and Bristol are working together as a virtual institute in a way, but very closely trying to say, instead of trying to compete against each other, why don't we work together to try to generate germplasm, then in a way it will benefit us all for a lot of the research we want to do, but will also benefit the breeders in terms of bringing new diversity into uh, UK germplasm. So this project has started and it's actually being mirrored. It's one of, one of the first initiatives in the US, France have also initiated the same initiatives, basically mirroring what the UK-led effort um, did. <coughs> the other thing I wanted to point out is that perhaps we're not sometimes aware of, of what's happening in terms of DNA, but actually we're in the middle of a DNA revolution. 
And I point out, this is the cost of sequencing the human genome. So it roughly cost $100 million to sequence the human genome just at the beginning of the century. And suddenly in uh, 2008, a change happened. Suddenly the cost of this went completely, completely down. So it now costs about $10,000 or actually $8,000 to sequence our human genome. So I'll tell you why this DNA sequencing revolution is allowing us to do things that we never thought we could. And I mean, I got my PhD here. So basically, I still thought that that wasn't possible. We didn't even study that. And I finished my PhD only four years, five years ago. But now actually we're literally having new technologies to address some of the tools that before would have been unthinkable. And I'll tell you some examples of how we're using this technology to, to do that. And the first thing you can see, what is the output of this? First of all, because the cost has gone down, we've actually been able to sequence the wheat and the barley genome. It's not a perfect sequence, it's not the finished product, but it's a great start. And, and we have basically a couple of articles coming out last year, but now actually breeders have access to all the pieces of the puzzle. The pieces are not all together, the order is not perfect, but the pieces are all there. So that's a huge start in terms of doing genetics for the breeders. And one of the things I want to say is that until now we've, we've tried to understand basically uh, simple traits in a way. Uh, how tall the plant is, it's basically one or two genes controlling that that we've understood. Granulization, spring or winter wheat, one or two major genes that control that. But a lot of the traits on the recommended list are actually very complex traits. They're very difficult to study, and it's not just one gene that controls them, but it's multiple genes. <coughs> so one of the key issues we have is how do we try to address these very complicated traits, and how do we actually try to tell, give breeders the tools to actually make varieties that will be better for you that respond to these traits. And one of the things that I would say is that although a lot of things we do are scientifically very interesting, actually a lot of them are very much focused on what's on the recommended list. So in, in terms of what we do in wheat genetics, you know, we think about if it's not on the recommended list, we're probably not looking at it too much at the moment. We do have plans in the future, which I'll show you again later, but again, a lot of the targets we're trying to work with breeders are basically recommended list targets. So one of those targets is uh, MINCH, orange wheat blossom MINCH. I just want to show how here uh, DNA and markers can really help the breeders. So with MINCH, we have this line down here, and basically it says, it's believed to be resistant to orange wheat blossom meat. So what does that mean, believed to be? Is that, you know, how do the breeders believe it to be or not know it? So basically it's based on a marker. So they actually extract DNA from the plant, and they say, if I have this type of band on a gel, it's resistant. If I don't have it, it's susceptible. But actually, the marker that they've been using is this one here. So basically that tells you just the number of spikes that are infested. So they've been trying to say, well, if you have the blue color, the light blue, you're resistant. If you have the other one, you're susceptible. And that's why you see a lot of mixed varieties that are supposed to be resistant that are not resistant. Because the marker they have is not very good. But we've been able to work now, actually funded by FSOB, by the French actually, so, but uh, working with the UK companies as well. And we've actually been able to find two new markers, for example, this one here. So that marker now tells the breeders that if I have this type of marker, this color, basically I have about 5% of my spikes are infested. If I have the other one, I have 55. So now the association they can do in terms of being believed to carry the gene, they can actually start making claims of it actually carries the gene. And that really helps because testing for MIDs is quite difficult. You cannot actually put it every year in the recommended list, but if you can actually have markers that tell you that, and have markers like this, not like that, it will help the breeders really get varieties and, and, and take away things that are not good at the beginning of the, of the, of the period. The other thing we're working on is pre-harvest sprouting. So that's been one of the key challenges I think that uh, I tried to tackle when I arrived. Again, it's a very complicated trade. We don't really have, uh, breeder, breeders don't really have a handle on what are the genes. They know that some varieties perform better year in, year out, and some perform worse, but I don't know how to select for those. So we've been uh, working on a project that started before I arrived, and now we've taken it on and trying to understand the genetics. And basically, you know, this slide, I don't need to tell you how, 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 how problematic it is, but it does raise one question that I, that I wanted to just address to you. Why it's difficult for scientists to actually work on applied problems? So if I can get a grant, I have to write a grant and I get three years of funding. So if I put my plants in the field, I have to see the plants be different because I'm trying to study genetic variation. So I want my two plants to be different in the field. So I have a year like this, where I actually have no pre-harvest sprouting. Basically, I lose the whole year. So that's a third of my grant gone. I need to publish papers. So to publish a paper, a lot of times, with that amount of variation, it's very, very difficult. So a lot of this research requires four to five years funding. But of course, no one wants to give money for four or five years. So it requires uh, schemes like the Lint scheme that was very, very successful in allowing some of this applied research to work and was a little bit more long-term and said so we recognize that field work is not like growing in a cabinet in the, in the, in the glass house, basically. So 
Um, but you have this problem, and the way we're trying to tackle this very, very, very complicated trait is to say the following. Based on the information we got uh, called QTL analysis, it's just a name we give it, we try to generate two lines that are almost identical to each other. So it's too complicated to look at all the genes. So what we try to say is, what happens if we make two lines, these are all the wheat chromosomes, so this, let's say, uh, you know, one right is side 19, and that's side 19 with a piece of something else in there. And we basically try to make two lines that are almost identical, but might have a thousand genes that are different, and then we try and compare them. If there's any difference between those two, we know that in that red region, there's something that's giving resistance to pre-harvest sprouting. So this is uh, real data from actually from last year, and these are four different regions that we're looking at. So for some reason, one of the QTLs, one of the regions, didn't work. The susceptible and the resistant allele had no difference. But actually in here, 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 we actually made two lines that were 99.5% identical, had a few genes different, but within those genes, there's something that's protecting it for sprouting in, this, in those three regions. <coughs> so now what breeders are doing now, we're working with them is actually to say, can we combine these different QTLs? Some QTLs actually, some of these genes protect you in, if it rains right when, uh, water, right when the grain is um, drying off. Some of them protects you when actually, when you're almost about to harvest, it protects you at that point. So the QTLs are quite different. So we're trying to combine those, again, into UK varieties, and basically this is, this is still probably four or five years until we get something in the market, or at least into recommended list trials, but at least it's a good start to be saying these very complex traits, we can actually have a hand on them. We know this region has that, and the breeders now can combine those regions, and they're actually doing that as we speak. So it's a complicated trait. This will not get me my promotion, my tenure. I will not get my tenure with this. I will get my tenure if I find the gene. But in the long run, I need to do these kind of exercises as well because they're equally important for the long run. So this is how we're trying to understand yield. So yield is one of those things that, again, uh, it's quite complicated because anything can affect yield. So the way we're trying to think about it is that if we can understand the last part, if we can actually make, understand how the grain gets bigger, longer, and wider, perhaps we can actually manipulate yield in a more, uh, in a more defined manner. And I'll give you an example of why, why we believe that. So this is how a QTL study looks. This is just telling you that we grew the plant several years and we have one region of the wheat genome that is significant. Basically, whenever you have one parent, you have higher yield than when you have the other. And basically, we made the same set of neoisogenic lines that I mentioned before, two lines, Spark and Rialto, so we make them almost identical, except that one of them has a small region of Rialto, and when you have that small region, you have two and a half increase in thousand grain weight, and that translates into four and a half increase in yield. And we do all these trials with the breeders to be sure that we're not trying to fool ourselves in just one replication, a few replications at John Innes. We actually do them across the UK to be sure that's actually what we're seeing. So actually, one small region can influence four and a half percent plug. Okay, fantastic, great. The next question, how does that affect in time, over years, how does that work? And that's one of the things we're doing now, but we're also trying to tease this apart, and we actually know that this specific region actually is affecting the width of the grain, not the length of the grain. Okay? So we have other QTLs that affect the length and not the width, and we're trying to put those together. But instead of just saying this thing affects yield, we're trying to say, okay, yield is too complicated, we're trying to affect thousand grain weight, one of the genes is making it wider, the other one is making it longer. Can we combine those two things together in a more targeted manner? And, and basically, just to give you an idea of the complexity of why we're trying to understand this, is that if I put the Let's say that's the negative and that's the one that has this, this small region that has the gene. If I put those two together side by side, it's very, very hard to tell the difference. If I put the positive in the back and I overlay the one that doesn't have the gene, basically that's, you know, that's what I'm studying. So it's not a very convincing argument to a funder why the heck am I studying you know, that much variation. Okay, that's one grain. Okay, that's 20 grains. Okay. You know, now, now, now you can actually, now, now the laughs are not that bad, right? Now people stop laughing when they show 20 grains, right? Because now you actually, oh, it's a one and a half extra grains. So actually it's pretty good. And if you now multiply that on a, you know, extra scale, now you, stop, you, 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 you see the yield. So the question now we have is, not only is that effect quite important, but the beautiful thing about wheat is that breeders have for a long time been selecting based on what they see. Seeing this is quite difficult, okay? But importantly, we, we talked about it has three different copies, it has three genomes that came together during evolution. Okay? So you have an A genome, a B genome, and a D genome. They all came together. So that means that you have three copies of every gene in wheat. And a lot of these traits are controlled, let's say, by a single gene. So you'll have three copies of that gene. So the breeders can only select when they find a mutation in one of those three genomes. And a lot of it's very subtle effect, like you see here. 
So the hypothesis that we have is that a lot of the genes that are determining yield, as have been seen in rice and other species, are actually genes that make the grain a little bit smaller just in case. Breeders have taken the brakes off and they get bigger brakes, just like in that case there. But we're only manipulating one of the three genomes. So our hypothesis, if we can actually understand what is the gene that's affecting that brain size, in this case on chromosome 6a, I then have a copy on 6b and 6d. I have on the other two genomes, I have two extra copies that I can manipulate. And perhaps there I will get the 10% or 6% increase in terms of grain size, and not just one and a half or 2% increase in grain size. So by actually taking it in, in rice and other systems, you can see the difference because one gene makes all the difference. In a week, if you knock out one gene, you change one gene, you still have two genes. So you might have to modify all three genes to see the big effect. So that's what, that's what we're doing at this moment now. We're trying to really get to the genetics, understand what is the gene, and then be able to manipulate that in the two other genomes. So we talked about rust, and we talked about rust before. So this is stem rust right there. So this is that famous UG99, Uganda 99 isolate that appeared. But you see actually, a lot of energy in the world has been focused on, uh, on stem rust because it's basically it's devastating African fields and so on. But actually, I think that you know, in those same fields, you see a lot more yellow in the background, which is what you have here, is yellow rust. And when you look at the developing world, actually yellow rust is more of a problem. Anything in orange is the yellow rust. It's more of a problem yellow rust than actually stem rust at the moment. So we said, can we actually find ways to try to tackle yellow rust, but in a slightly different manner? So today, we've basically been focused on the plant. So breeders have basically have a susceptible variety, they cross it with another one, and they now have a variety that has a resistance gene, a yellow rust resistance gene, fantastic. And then it's just a matter of time until warrior or stig or torch or solstice or robulus, you name it, becomes like that. So it's just a matter of time, right? So we're always kind of one step behind knowing that the pathogen will evolve, but we have no idea about the pathogen. And we have no idea about the pathogen because it's very difficult to work with this pathogen because you cannot grow it in the lab. You have to grow it on a, on a leaf, living leaf. But now with, with that DNA revolution that I mentioned, we can actually start thinking, can we understand how the pathogen has changed over the last 20 to 30 years? And basically at NIA, Rosemary, who heads the UK Serial Pathogen Virulence Survey, has all the virulence, all the isolates from the old Norman Hobbit and so on for the last 20 or 30 years. So she actually has the spores of those isolates that were collected in 1988 that then changed to infect Hobbit and then so on, before the solstice, after the solstice, now with the new warrior isolate. We have all those spores, but we have no idea how the pathogen has changed. But actually by sequencing, this is what we started doing, we started sequencing some of these isolates. These are five isolates that we've sequenced so far. This experiment at the end of my PhD five years ago would have cost $100,000. This experiment, which we did last year, cost $2,000. That's the level, the transformation <coughs> that we're seeing, and why we can ask questions that we've never been able to do before. So before, even thinking about sequencing this, would have been millions of dollars. Now, well, let's say, actually sequencing this, would probably be about six to $7,000. So it really changes the, the way that we can ask questions. That's why I think it's a revolution in that way. So the hope that we have is that if we can actually understand how the pathogen has changed, how it's adapted to the genes that the breeders have put, perhaps we can think of a more intelligent manner that the breeders can deploy genes for a more intelligent resistance strategy that will be more effective in the field. We're not saying it's gonna be durable forever, but we know Claire was quite durable, but now it's falling, but at least we're giving a chance that that resistance will not break from one year to another, and varieties will be out of the recommended list from one year to the next. <coughs> because we have this DNA revolution, we can also do quite interesting things. I can actually collect tissue of an infected leaf, such as spore, that's going inside, I collect tissue and sequence all the DNA in that tissue. So I know all the genes that the pathogen is actually turning on in the plant. I can actually sequence one specific structure and know what genes are there. That's what we think is a critical interface between the two things. And then I can start comparing and seeing out of the 30,000 genes that the pathogen has, what are the genes that are actually expressed, you know, right here at the right time, at the right place in the correct varieties. And actually there's very few of them that come up as being, you know, very important for the pathogen, we, we believe. So by using this strategy, we compare two, two isolates from the UK, one of them that was not able to infect robulus or solstice, and then the other one is the solstice isolate, and we sequenced them, we found all the genes, and now if you do all this analysis, you get actually that between those two lines, they're almost identical, but there's five genes only that are expressed at the right time or the right place. And now we're doing all the biology to understand what those genes do to see if we can come up with resistance strategies that are more intelligent. And by doing this also, 
For example, the warrior race is being sequenced as we speak, and the idea will be that the serum path in virulence survey, you can imagine that whenever you send samples to, uh, to Rosemary, again, we can just take some of that sequence that I know very fast if we're facing something new in the field, or if it's just a small change from what we're seeing before. So that's kind of where we're thinking of about using these technologies to really move how we uh, combat the disease. I want to give you an example also about uh, Odyssey Brave, and this work that's being done by uh, Lars Ostergaard and joining us. And this has to do with pot shattering, okay? So here, this is outside of my scope, but I'll, I'll try to interpret it as best as I can. I think it's a nice example where you say, well, we're actually trying to work on a crop, using information from a model species and trying to do transgenics. And, and the, so the question was, will transgenic make pod shattering policy break? So this is the species that a lot of people work in the John Innes, which is called the Rapidopsis. It's a little weed that grows this big, but it grows really fast, it's really cheap to grow, so you can basically get a lot of papers very fast. Uh, but who cares about that, right? So on the other side of there's Brassica, what we really care about. But the nice thing is that if you look at those, they actually look very similar, the fruit looks very, very similar, remarkably similar, because they're both brassica crops, or species. So actually, the, the, the tissues they have are, are very, very similar. Okay, so the valves and all that, they're very, very similar. So Lars <coughs> has been working all his life on this Arabidopsis, and basically was able to say, he made this, all this thing, and basically what that, that's, how, that's how geneticists speak, basically saying, these two genes turn on, make a day essence zone that breaks the, 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 the pod open, and this gene actually represses them, and basically does not allow that to form, so it will make a pod that doesn't open, <coughs> theoretically. So we tested that hypothesis, and says, I'll make a transgenic, a transgenic uh, rape that will actually not have a, a, a pod that opens. And he was able to do that. So he was able to make a transgenic uh, rape seed oil, or rape, that actually did not shatter. But the problem was that you couldn't break it with a hammer. So basically, he was with a hammer, you could hear a bandy trying to break it open. He just didn't break. Okay, so transgenics in that case wasn't the solution. So then he says, well, I'm more intelligent than that, I'll do it another way. So instead of trying to turn on the thing that stops these genes, I'm going to take that gene and I'm going to eliminate that gene. I'm going to take it away. So if I take that away, basically I shouldn't have this because it will never form. Because that gene is what forms that they has and so on. So he did that as well, he made the transgenic, turned the gene off, and basically you can see it. Again, two hammers to break that thing. <laughs> Nothing. No seeds were coming out. Okay? And this just shows you the tissue. But basically, this is how the tissue looks. So you have this zone that's kind of... Imagine like those stamps when you get that are kind of like cut before they're pre-perforated that you can cut really easily. That's what the plant is doing. It makes those cuts, so it's very easy to break. In this case, it's like they were... You, know, you had to cut them with a scissor. Imagine that as an example. So what Lars said, well, if I cannot do it transgenically, perhaps there's other technologies that I can use. And he's using something called tilling, which is non-transgenic. And what he can do is actually, he can go from this, which is the wild type, the pre-perforated stamps to the scissors, and you can actually find two sorts of these genes, two variations, slight variations of the gene, that actually, you can see here, you're getting halfway between that and that over there. Okay? So you don't have the cells that are almost cut, but you have something a lot better than these big cells over here. So by doing that, <coughs> Lars is now betting that with those type of genes, we can now actually have oxy break that will not shatter. So we have a, um, a crop improvement research club, um, a crop club grant to move these two types of genes into OLC break, just traditionally, and see if you can actually make <coughs> pod shutting OLC break. And that's literally something that's being done as we speak. So the key thing here is that if you put the incentive for people who are brilliant, who work on a rhabdopsis, and you say, look, there's real problems, there's money, a lot of them actually want to do good things. But it's just that the incentives aren't there. If you put the incentives, you'll see a lot of people move. And that's what this guy did. Lars never worked in the field. He now has this crop improvement club. He's working in the field. And what do we need? We need more brilliant minds working in, in these crops. There's another brilliant mind. So it's uh, Jonathan Jones from the Sainsbury lab. And his interest is uh, potato leg blight. So he knows that in this little, that's a tuber right there from the Andes. So it's still potato leg blight that you put any type of blight on it, on this potato, and that crop is resistant. And this is a desert potato, which is not very resistant. So he said, actually, he was able to understand the genetics of that small little potato and find genes that gave resistance. So he actually made a desiree, a transgenic desiree, that has three of those genes from this guy. So if you try to do the crossing, you could do it. It would take years and years and years, and you would have probably a lot of linkage drive and yield. So he said, instead of doing like that, what if I find the genes, and then just transfer three genes into this plant, and that's what you get. Staggering effects. That's available, that's technology, that's UK technology, it's there to be grown, but we can grow it. And that's how the fields look. 
It's, there's actually a field in, 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 in Holland because the trials that we had to do here were just impossible uh, with cages and everything. So he had, he's doing some of these trials in Badminton and some in the US. But it, it's really incredible how these, of course, these are the transgenics and these are the ones that haven't been sprayed. Okay? So there's a lot of potential as well. So transgenic will not always be a solution. But it's an example where it's probably a good solution, something that we face today. No sprays and those drop. So how sustainable is not going for the transgenic option in this case. And the last example I want to talk about is uh, perhaps something that is a little bit more, more distant future. I think it's quite exciting. It's about uh, nitrogen fixing wheat. Okay? So we've heard it all before. I'll tell you what the approach that someone in the John Ennis is working on and trying to think about this. And he has a project from the Gates Foundation to do this. So it basically says huge amount of nitrogen consumption, but there's also a lot of areas that could produce wheat that are basically limited by the amount of nitrogen. So the key thing is the following. Basically the legumes, we know the legumes are forming these interactions with nitrogen fixing rhizobia, and he says the following. Actually, this is a mycorrhizae. So most species actually form mycorrhizae. They, they actually form these associations uh, in the soil. And basically, there's a, mycorrhizae, there's a mycorrhizal factor, a mic factor, that the plant recognizes and says, ooh, I'll form a mycorrhizae. And then actually, likewise, in terms of this, there's a knot factor, a nodulation factor, that makes the roots of legumes form nodules. Okay? But actually, when they started doing the, the, the basic biology, they found that those two factors that are in the soil are almost identical. Okay, if you switch this guy around like that, they're the same, basically. So almost identical, okay? So that's the first thing. So the signal that's in the soil is very, very similar to make nodules and mycorrhizae. And the next thing I'll show you is what is really interesting. All land plants can make mycorrhizae. Just a few of them can make nodules. So that then started think, Jao's thinking, saying, well, actually, if you can all make mycorrhizae and a few can make uh, nodules, Perhaps making nodules is just one form of making mycorrhiza. Basically, the idea is that if all of them can actually make mycorrhiza and a few can make nodules, perhaps there's just a few tweaks that we can make to make them all make nodules. That's the idea. And then he's done a lot of the basic biology, which could not have been done in any crop. They had to be done in the, in the model species. And he's found that nodules are basically made by a series of genes that work together. Okay? The critical thing here is that basically he's found the following. All the genes to make mycorrhizae are the same. So actually, all the plants have the inherent ability to make nodules, but legumes have the ability to change a couple of genes here and a couple of genes here to make nodules. So the question is, can you actually make plants that do mycorrhizae, which are all plants, understand that there's now not a mycorrhizae factor, but a nodulation factor, which I showed you are almost identical. So everything is there. So Basically, wheat plants, rice plants are all hardwired to make mycorrhizae, and inherently they're hardwired to potentially make nodules. And it's actually made rice that make nodules. So now he's trying to say, can you make maize, and this is kind of a model species for, 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 for uh, monocots, that actually can make nodules. So it's a long-term project, and he said, be very careful how you say it. So basically, project step number one, five-year project, is just to engineer a, a, a maize plant to recognize that factor, that's the first step. That will take five years. Probably another five years, it will take to actually make a nodule. And then a five years to actually, so it still is a long-term process, but the hope that he has is that not only can you make this in the roots, but actually there's some legumes that fix nitrogen in the stem. So what you see here is a cross-section, and that's basically what's fixing nitrogen, and these little dots that you see here, okay? So the potential is huge, and this is, very, very basic, you know, very basic research, but that has an application and an ambition. And this is the first step out of four that he's doing to, to get there. So with that, just some final thoughts is that, you know, in terms of public investment, we really need to, to make that difference when we want to make it. We need to start investing now. I think one of the critical things would be to maintain a sense of urgency. It's really easy to say, we need to do this now and then in three years, forget about it. But we really need those 15 to 20 years to move things from the lab into your field. It really takes a long time. There's no way around it but uh, that's what we're trying to do. The DNA revolution is here. You could imagine many ways that's gonna affect your business, but also for us is how can we understand those complex traits for those then complex traits to be put into varieties that readers can, can, can release. I think that the other critical thing I would say here is that basic science is not the enemy of applied science. I think that's, that's an important concept. I don't think, I don't like when people start saying basic science and, and, you know, and applied science. It's science. That's why it's, 
you know, it's plant science, it's not plant basic science, it's science. And when we start discussing about more money into applied science, it should be more money into science, and some of that should be definitely focused on applied because it has to be in today, it should come. They're one and the same. I think that the funding schemes are really important. If you put the incentive... Someone's out there, it's disappeared. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, that wasn't me. Uh, so I think that the funding schemes are really important. Anyone responds to incentives. All the incentives that have been placed for scientists have never been about talking to you. Just spending a day here has never been an incentive for any scientist. Now it is. So take advantage of that. You actually have a lot of power in the funding agencies. If you say we need more of this, but and, and, and if you go with the message of basic science and applied science, you get probably a much better reception than just saying we want more money into translation. Because that's probably not the solution. You need to have both things. And we found that if you cut part of it, it doesn't work. You need to have the whole thing together. The other thing is that uh, something that's difficult for as a scientist that you want to try to do some transgenics, but then you don't know who the farmers are, who actually wants transgenics, do they want them, do they not, you get a lot of misinformation. So my point here would be, if you actually want transgenics to be part of the tools that we look at, I think that you need to be more vocal, okay? Perhaps you are being, but at least at the science level, at the council level, it might not be reaching. So I think that's important because if we're thinking about the nitrogen fixing wheat, it's not like there's nitrogen fixing wheat in 40 years and then all of a sudden it's great. We really need to make the progress now so that the public will understand that these are tools that we need to be at least investing in and that we don't have to conduct our trials in the US. It makes no sense at all. And the other thing I would say is that, as, as Tony said, it's not just genetic diversity, but also human diversity that makes this a, a, a richer experience. So with that, just to thank a lot of the people who, who, who are funding and a lot of the collaborators whose work I've shown today. Thank you.